focused on missing Colorado mom, Kelsey Barrett. Did you believe she was dead the moment you heard she'd been missing? Either dead or held against her will. Her fiance headed to trial. He was manipulative and enjoyed control. I believe he murdered her. Is there enough to convict? She saw the outline of a body that she believes was Kelsey. The details read like a horror novel. Coming up next. Season 11 starts now. I became a doctor to help people heal. Now I'm using the same science and medicine to take on true crime. The case of Kelsey Barrett chills me to the core. This beautiful 29-year-old new mother went missing last year. Her case was known as the missing mom mystery. To this day, her body has never been found. The investigation into her case would reveal a secret love affair with an alleged devious plot to commit a brutal murder. Prosecutors claim it was all masterminded by Kelsey's fiance, Patrick Frazee, with the help of his mistress, Crystal Lee Kinney. Now, behind bars, Frazee's trial is finally set to begin. Crime correspondent Melissa Moore has the story. Take a look. Kelsey Barrett was last seen on November 22nd, 2018. Here she is on supermarket surveillance footage shopping with her one-year-old daughter. Her estranged fiance, Patrick Frazee, is said to be the last person to have seen Barrett when he claimed she left their daughter with him. December 2nd, Barrett is reported missing by her concerned mother, who's been unable to reach her for 10 days. Responding officers find Barrett's home empty. Her cars, her clothes, and her toothbrush all appeared untouched. Family and friends take to social media, spurring a viral search effort to no avail. Scrutiny soon falls on Patrick Frazee. On December 14th, police search his home. Then on December 21st, he is charged with first degree murder and solicitation to commit murder. While we have not found Kelsey at this time, information has been developed that is helping to narrow down our search. As you can tell from the arrest, sadly, we do not believe Kelsey is still alive. Police allege Frazee beat Barrett to death with a baseball bat in her apartment on November 22nd and enlisted his lover, Idaho nurse Crystal Lee Kenny, to help clean up the crime scene and dispose of the body. Kenny, now cooperating with investigators, stated in an affidavit that Frazee initially tried to pressure her into murdering Barrett. On one occasion, by poisoning her coffee, on another, by hitting her with a metal pipe. According to the affidavit, she was in Idaho on November 22nd when Frazee texted, you need to get out here now. You've got a mess to clean up. She understood that as Barrett has been killed. Kenny arrived with bleach, gloves, a hairnet, shoe covers, and other cleaning supplies and helped clean the crime scene. She says Frazee told her details of the murder. He was having her guess the scents of different candles. She was blindfolded and distracted. He hit her with a bat, causing her death. Two envelopes with teeth in them were found by police in Frazee's home. According to Kenny, Frazee burned Barrett's body on his property. Police have been unsuccessful at locating her remains. On April 17th, they concluded their search. In May, Patrick Frazee pleaded not guilty. He's awaiting trial. It's reported that his defense team have made requests to suppress evidence and introduce an alternate suspect. And there is speculation that the suspect they will name is Crystal Lee Kenny. Joining me now is crime correspondent Melissa Moore. Thank you for being here. Thank you. There's no body. Right. The, the mistress claims that Patrick Frazee brutally beat her to death. And the details in the affidavit are read like a horror novel. So what's most rattling you about this case? Uh, this case is about extreme betrayal. Unlike any case I've ever worked on, this poor victim, Kelsey, I think we can all relate to Kelsey. She's going to the supermarket you know, for Thanksgiving, forgot a couple ingredients. She texted, uh, she texted Patrick saying, do you want to have some sweet potato casserole? So that tells me in itself that Patrick has said that they weren't together anymore, that they broke up. First of all, 
who, if you're broke up, are you going to be asking if you want a sweet potato casserole? No. The second part, though, that debunks what he's saying, saying that they broke up, is the fact that, according to Kenny, in her affidavit, she said that the how he lured her is that he went to the house, blindfolded her. Who do you know trust an ex-boyfriend or fiance to blindfold you? She's smelling candles. He tells her to smell these different candles. So and he so, blindfolds her under yeah. the guise that she got this romantic thing going on? Exactly. And so my mind goes to, as a female, I'm thinking, okay, it's fall. Is she smelling pumpkin spice, vanilla? Like, she's relaxed. And that's where the horror starts. Like, the fact that she's blindfolded, he hits her across the head with a baseball bat, so much so that her, tooth, her teeth fly across, fly, sorry, it just really rattles me up, uh, flies across the room. And Crystal's part of this? That's what baffles me the most, is that here we have this mistress who knows about Kelsey, knows that she's a mother, in, and then she's solicited a couple times by Patrick to come and kill her. She meets, she actually meets uh, Kelsey. She actually comes down and gives her a Starbucks coffee. She was supposed to poison it. So the fact that she actually went that far to meet her tells me something's not right with Crystal. I mean, she breaks every code of honor in the women's code. You know, the fact that, first of all, she's, it tells me she's competing against Kelsey and has something to, she wants to win. Again, you know? these are allegations. We, we don't know, right. which is what we're hearing. Right. What would have been the motive? Why would a man want to kill a woman so much so that he'd go through this difficulty? Well, what we do know is that there was a custody battle for this little girl. And, and then again, I think about a psychopath, a, a, a sociopath. They don't really, like my father, he didn't really want to be a dad. I don't think Patrick really wanted to be a full-time dad. I think he wanted to hurt Kelsey. I think he wanted control over her. Here's this beautiful woman who's a pilot. Yeah. She has everything to live for. She has this beautiful little girl, and she can leave and be successful without him. And I don't think she—I don't think he liked that—that that she could be on her own. And this is what tells me about uh, abusive relationships, because I look at this and I believe she was in an abusive relationship with Patrick. Mm -hmm. And what I know about abusive relationships is that everything can look okay on the surface, and she probably wanted people to know everything was okay. But I believe from everything I've read and the research that I've done that she was in an abusive relationship, that he was trying to control her. And in, in abusive relationships, there's a stage called love bombing. And so what made me think that they were in a love bombing stage is the fact that he was wooing her with this candle set up the day that, that allegedly he killed what her. What is love bombing? Love bombing is when, so you know, anybody at home that's listening to this, if they're in a relationship and they have a pattern, you can see this. It's initially, where they give you everything that you need. They know all your buttons. They know what you love. They know how to woo you. That's the charm. They give you everything you want. It's flowers, it's cleaning the house. It's everything that you would desire in, in a man uh, or in a partner. And then the second stage is devaluation. That's when you start to, you start to get the pull away. They're not, they're back in their old pattern, not treating you as well. They start to make comments to you, like putting you down. I think he was degrading her character. I think that becomes the tape that goes into your head, similar to what my dad would say about me. He would say negative things about me, and I started to believe it. And this is, this is the point where people ask, like, why do you stay in an abusive relationship? It's because they break down your character. They break down your identity of how you see yourself. So he was able, I believe, to keep her trapped in this relationship due to that. And then the final stage is discard. And in this case, I believe he murdered her. As a way of discarding her. Mm -hmm. The family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit. Why? Why would they go through that when he's being charged for murder? Well, I think of it similar to OJ, how they didn't get a conviction on OJ for Nicole Simpson, so they pursued him financially. And, and then in this case, if he's found innocent, then he can still, he can sell his story to the media, to books, to, to movies. Mm -hmm. And I think they want to make sure that he never profits from this and that, he, he, that this follows him in some way. And he's a, you know, he, if I, is it correct he's wearing a bulletproof vest when he goes right. to court? Right. So, so much he's disliked? This is, I mean, well, for all moms out here, like, <laughs> if you had to go to court and hear that your daughter was brutally attacked in this manner, there's something primal in a mother. They call it mama bear, you know, yeah. where you are going to lash out, you are going to react. And I don't know if I could sit in a courtroom 
look at the man that killed my daughter and not react, especially when I'm hearing testimony. And not only that, I mean, we also are in Colorado. People do carry guns there. I, I don't know. I, I would think somebody would probably want to hurt him. Up next, an exclusive interview with Kelsey's childhood friend and how she knew Kelsey was dead from the moment she disappeared. Don't go away. We're taking you inside the chilling case of missing mom Kelsey Barrett. Did the father of her baby girl, Patrick Frazee, brutally murder her after having a secret love affair? And now, has his mistress turned on him? Patrick Frazee remains behind bars awaiting his upcoming trial. We've got the details. Don't go away. Medical mysteries. How can a sore throat leave you in a coma? It just got worse and worse and worse until eventually I had to call 911. And she thought she had a brain tumor, but what it turned out to be... They found an egg. ...was a deadly worm. Put it under a microscope and out came a tapeworm. Came out of the egg. Plus, Dr. Oz gets real on health court. The decisions you're making are going to cost you your life. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. An Oz exclusive, George and Cindy Anthony on the rumors. How do you feel about Casey having more children? And a potential reunion. What would it take for her to come back? That's coming up next week. We're back discussing the devastating case of 29-year-old Colorado mom, Kelsey Barrett, whose fiance, Patrick Frazee, is alleged to have plotted her murder with the help of his mistress, Crystal Lee Kenny. Her alleged motive, rather his alleged motive, to gain full custody of their baby. Joining me now is Nicole, Kelsey's childhood friend. I thank you for being here. I know this is a sensitive time for you and the family. Mm -hmm. What do you believe really happened to Kelsey? You just heard Melissa describe some of the background. You've been following the case closer than anybody. Mm -hmm. There's uh, just a horrific amount of uh, testimony that's come out after the fact, but. Um, I just know from the very beginning when we heard that she was missing, you know, at that point it had already been 10 days and um, I knew right off the bat something wasn't right. It was not something that Kelsey would have wanted to do to be away for that long. She wouldn't have gone missing um, without contacting at least her mom. I mean, she's very close with her family, especially her mom. Um, so the fact that no one had heard from her for that amount of time um, just crushed me from the very moment. Something was not right. Did you believe she was dead the moment you heard she'd been missing? Either dead or held against her will. They're, those are the only two options. Let's talk a little bit about Patrick. Mm -hmm. There were issues between Patrick and Kelsey. Mm -hmm. Did you know much about what was going on there? I didn't know anything at the time. Um, I, I hadn't you know, really discussed that specifically with Kelsey. Um, but after the fact, in talking to one of our friends, uh, she had confided in another friend that there were issues, even before the baby was born, there were some control issues and, um, you know, things that, that, that didn't sit well with our other friend. And uh, she kind of kind of talked to her about that a little bit. But, um, you know, Kelsey's a, a really strong person. She's strong-willed. She uh, she's, has strong family ties. Her family, like I said, her family's very tight-knit. So I can imagine with the baby on the way, she would want to keep things together. She'd want to work through things. Yeah. Um, but we just didn't know exactly where all this was going to go. So it would fit her personality not to have verbalized a lot. Yeah, yeah, she's not one to go out and talk about people. You know, there was an instance from earlier in our childhood where she had an issue with somebody, but I didn't know about it until later when another friend told me uh, just because she didn't like that person talking negatively about someone else. So she's not one to go out and, and rustle up enemies where she doesn't need to. She's not, she doesn't want to stir up controversy or, you know, things like that. Sometimes you want to be a stick in the mud. <laughs> and in particular, when there's concerns about abuse. It, mm -hmm. It's hard for people to help if they don't know. Mm -hmm. Melissa just spoke to the fact that he may have been quote unquote love bombing her, mm -hmm. manipulating her emotionally. If in fact the allegations are true and she was blindfolded in almost a romantic way just mm -hmm. to sniff on a candle when she was beaten with a baseball bat, it would signify a very devious mind in Patrick. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about whether that might be true? Anything you've heard from the friends group about whether he had that type of a mindset? It very well could be, um, from what it sounded like from our other friend, that he 
uh, he was manipulative and that he, he you know enjoyed control and, and um, part of that is you know controlling her to think that she is in a safe place you know so it, it kind of could fit the fit the narrative there there's a, a little baby involved mm -hmm. it was just a year old when her, when the mom disappeared mm -hmm. how's she doing She's thriving. She's a beautiful little girl. She's wonderful. Um, I have two little girls as well, so um, I, I've really done my best to um, grow that relationship between her and my daughter so she has a support group. She's going to have, um, you know, cousins to grow up with um, because she doesn't have any other um, family outside of, you know, the, the immediate family there, you know, so we're just, we're surrounding her, we're loving her, she's, she's wonderful, um, we're just so thankful we can have this time with her. And how is the family keeping the memory of Kelsey alive? There's a few different ways. Um, at Kelsey's memorial service, they had these uh, this basket full of rocks that people could come and put little notes on there for for baby Kaylee and um, tell her little memories about her mom. Um, Kaylee loves to walk around with rocks and uh, you know little things like that. So that was a, a neat little thing they could do to make a little rock memorial rock garden for her. The family's also going to uh, put together a memory book. Um, I started a secret group on Facebook for people who personally knew Kelsey, so that we could share memories, share pictures and stories so that the family will have as much as possible to put together so that she will know how wonderful her mom was. Well, I'm happy you're doing that and I'm happy you try and get your kids to bond with her a bit. Thank you for visiting with us. Absolutely, thank you. We'll be right back. The trial of Patrick Frazee is set to begin soon. Criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan is breaking down the dark side of what could have led Patrick Frazee to brutally kill the mother of his child. Stay with us. Are you a true crime junkie? A secret sleuth? If so, we need you to help solve the crime. Head to DrOz.com slash Crime Hunters to join in on our investigation. We'll be posting exclusive evidence, clues, and special police bulletins. Look closely because you have the power to crack the case. Become a Dr. Oz Crime Hunter today. We're back going inside the mysterious case of the 29-year-old missing Colorado mom, Kelsey Barrett. Prosecutors claim her fiancé, Patrick Frazee, plotted to kill her and had his mistress, Crystal Lee Kenny, clean up the crime scene. Patrick Frazee is alleged to have plotted Kelsey's murder for months in order to gain full custody of their daughter. And Kelsey's body has yet to be found but she's presumed to be dead. Now we're asking, will this mounting circumstantial evidence keep Patrick Frazee behind bars? Here to help shed light on this case is criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan, who I thank you very much for being here. Always great to be here. So what could drive a seemingly ordinary person to commit such a vicious murder? I mean, this is, this demands that we seek out what is at the heart of the case. Two words, and we hear it all the time, but it always prevails, it's power and control. And you have to understand that we don't really know what could have been going on behind closed doors. Uh, at the same time, Kelsey had been talking about moving back to her home state. They have this one-year-old daughter. She's going to take her daughter with her. They are estranged. They are not married. They're engaged, but they live in two different residences. That sounds like the relationship could be fizzling, and she wants out. I think he sensed that, and he couldn't stand that sense of loss. Uh, for some people, they have a very strong competitive spirit. If he can't have her, no one can. If she wants to leave, the answer is no. And I think that that sense of power and control really kind of got suppressed and finally bubbled up to the surface. It's a character flaw. It's not a mental illness. But some people just tamp it down until it comes out in a very ugly way. Did Patrick have any signs, any history of being violent like this? You know, Dr. Oz, as far as we know, no. We don't know of any history of actual physical abuse, certainly not. We have one account that when his daughter was born, he started to lose it uh, because she had some special care. And when they took her away, he freaked out and was abusive to the staff. They actually had to call a social worker in to deal with him. Mm -hmm. So I think that could have been a red flag. But understand, we don't always see a long history of violence. Again, it bubbles to the surface. And in his case, I think he was very brooding and he thought about it for a very long time, months until we have that one alleged violent act, which took Kelsey's life. 
What is the mistress saying happened to Kelsey? The mistress. Crystal Lee Kenny is the linchpin in this case. Now, she has known Patrick since college, and they have had, according to her ex-husband, a relationship that went on and off over the years. Oh, my. Yeah, and the months, uh, Crystal got actually divorced from her husband last summer, and between September 1st and Thanksgiving last year, Patrick solicited his girlfriend, Crystal, to kill his fiance, Kelsey at least three times. The first by poisoning the coffee. Crystal happens to be an RN. She has access to narcotics and Patrick wanted her to drug the coffee, give her a latte and hopefully it would kill her. And uh, Crystal said she was just unable to do that. So then he suggested on two more occasions, he gave her a metal pipe and wanted her to beat Kelsey to death with it. And she refused to do that. But isn't that when you leave? At what point do you run away? <laughs> the, this is kind of the interesting thing. She lived in Idaho. He lived in Colorado. Now, they owned a horse together, and so she had occasion to go see him all the time. Uh, she has two children and an ex-husband in Idaho. She says she got a call in Idaho on that Thanksgiving day, November 22nd last year, and he said, come here right now. You've got a mess to clean up. And she knew in her heart that he had killed Kelsey. When she got there, she found the big bloody mess and spent hours and hours cleaning it up. And she agreed to come down there. She's, she's attesting, attesting to that. Oh, this really raises the question, you know, is she a co-conspirator? Is she an accomplice? Was she a victim herself that she was under the power and control of Patrick, thinking that when Kelsey was out of the picture, she might be able to be with him? It all fell apart very quickly. Or she's framing him. I mean, there's so many things that could be happening. There really are. Well, and, you know... I'm sorry, why is it Crystal in jail? Well, Crystal is very, well, Crystal is very clever right now. She's playing let's make a deal with the prosecutor. She has given them, first of all, she lied to the police from the outset. They had alibis set up, but when she finally came clean, she has given them the story that she says Patrick told her about how he killed Kelsey, the, the blindfolding her, the coming over on Thanksgiving Day, uh, playing a romantic game of guess the smell of the candles, and then picking up a baseball bat and beating her so ruthlessly that the teeth flew out of her head. Now, she got this story, she says, from Patrick. And according to her story and the pings on the cell phone, and this is going to be the key with the evidence, her story does make sense if Patrick told her the truth. So Kelsey's body has not been found yet, but teeth were found at Patrick's home during an investigative search. We don't know for sure if these teeth are Kelsey's, but investigators, prosecutors, plan to conduct DNA testing in order to confirm that. How were they able to address the police? How were they able to arrest Patrick Frazee without proof that Kelsey was even murdered? Well, don't forget the jury will be the finder of the facts and determine if it's proof. This is going to be a case of circumstantial evidence. We have some direct evidence, blood evidence, and we'll go over that, but 70% of this, in my estimation, is Crystal's testimony. That is the circumstantial evidence that allows us to infer and connect these dots and come to a conclusion. So a few different things. We know that the police cadaver dog scented blood on a mop and uh, the bleach that was found at Kelsey's home. Mm -hmm. We know, of course, uh, about the teeth. Uh, and this is, to me, the most interesting thing. In his residence, they found an envelope with four teeth in it and a separate envelope with one tooth in it, a tooth fragment. So and bizarre. It is bizarre, but again, according to Crystal, she says that she found a tooth when she was cleaning up that scene and she gave it back to Patrick. The police are trying to figure out if that's one of the teeth in the envelopes. Now that is what we call the direct evidence, the forensic evidence, but the fourth and most important thing is the pings of the cell phone because they draw it all together and they corroborate Crystal's story and make it sound true. It involves burner phones and taking Kelsey's phone across state lines to make it look like she was visiting her parents. But when Crystal finally told this story and they compared it to the cell phone pings, it makes sense. How about the body? What do you think that is? Any evidence from anybody involved? According to Crystal, Patrick removed Kelsey's body before she got there in a big black tote. He hid it in a haystack for a day or two and then she accompanied him to a place on his property where he put it in a livestock watering trough and burned it with five gallons of gasoline. She says she never actually saw Kelsey's body in that tote, but when it melted, she saw the outline of a body that she believes was Kelsey. Now, burned so badly along with her ID and any other evidence, clothing, bloody stuff, um, 
that they don't believe any evidence of that will be found because according to Crystal, he either took those ashes and put them in the river or in the dump. Yeah. But just because you don't have a body doesn't mean you don't have a crime and the circumstantial evidence with that testimony is what could get him convicted. So Patrick Frazier's trial is set to start soon. Yep. You believe in your professional opinion that he will be convicted? I do, but again, the linchpin is Crystal, all right? She has been given a plea deal just for tampering with evidence. It goes back to those cell phones that she was taking across state lines. Crystal is going to be either the prosecutor's best friend or worst enemy on the stand. It depends on how she, she handles cross-examination because don't forget, she did lie to them initially, so you lie once, how do we know you're not lying Oof. now? But if she tells the truth and it is the story and the cell phones corroborate it and we get a really smart jury who's willing to go slowly and methodically and connect the dots to the evidence, I absolutely believe that we will get a conviction. But they're not going to sentence Crystal until after she serves as their witness. It's clever, it's wise. Yes. We'll be following this story to review the case files on Patrick Frazee in chilling detail. You can go to DrOz.com slash Crime Hunters. Dr. Jordan, encyclopedic as always. Always great to be here. Thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> Up next, we're investigating the murdered body of a 20-year-old man found buried in a metal trash can. His identity has remained a mystery until now. Can you help us solve his murder? That's next. We had a responsibility to shed light on these stories. So this is not the average case of a whodunit. I love how bad guys get caught using science. Y'all ready to do this? We all gonna do it together. The person whose life you save will be someone that you know. I'm so thankful for you. The power of 11 starts with one. One show, The Dr. Oz Show. On today's True Crime, we're investigating the murdered body of a 20-year-old man found buried in a metal trash can decades ago. For 34 years, his identity has remained a mystery. Until now. One police department stopped at nothing to solve this case. And now finally, just this year, DNA science and forensic genealogy has led these investigators to a name, uncovering the identity of a man only known for decades as John Doe. Joining me now is investigative genetic genealogist C.C. Moore and Detective Regina Collier. Pleasure nice. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Good to be back with you. Nice to see you. So this cold case has been left unsolved for decades. It's a long time. What makes it different from the many other cases your department has had to investigate? Well, this case, being born and raised in the county, in Anne Arundel County, um, basically I remember this case back from when I was in middle school hmm. in seventh grade. And it was, you know, I'm just starting to pay attention to the news and things like that. And you're thinking, why is this person just discarded in this mental trash can where they're building them all? So that was one thing that I always remembered the case. And so when I did get on the department and we started looking at cases, mm -hmm. it was something that none of the detectives ever let up on. We reached out um, to our citizens many times. But no, all these years, though, it starts to become a bit... <laughs> Frustrating, I'm sure. Yes, and the leads begin to dry up. Cece, when you first heard about this case as John Doe, what were your impressions? Well, I could tell that the, both the department and Parabon had a deep emotional investment in this case. And I've always been interested in trying to help recover the names of these unidentified victims. So this was something that I really wanted to work on. And I was very excited that the department was willing to allow me to do so. So I want to illustrate how far technology has come. Take a look at this photo. This is a 1985 claimation of what this man's, John Doe's face, may have looked like. And this is a recent snapshot illustration done by Parabon called phenotyping. Of the same person, right? Phenotyping is now able to turn the smallest piece of DNA evidence into a detailed snapshot of someone's entire face. But what this image didn't do was lead investigators to discover the victim's identity, because you just have a picture of them that's accurate. Someone's got to recognize that photo. So last year, Detective Collier's division teamed up with C.C. Moore to help break this cold case using an emerging tool called genetic genealogy. And I want C.C. to walk us through this, because this is the part of the puzzle that's so fascinating to me as a physician. So come on back here. C.C. discovered two family matches, and from there, she had to create a complete family tree, starting from a couple, that dated back to the 1800s. So, what is significant about finding two matches? 
So why it's important to have more than one match is because if we only have one match, we have no idea which part of the family tree connects to this unknown victim. Mm -hmm. Once I have two matches, that can help to point me to a common ancestor. So in this case, we had this first match, who was the closest, and then we had a second match that popped up on Jed match. So we didn't originally have so that. So if you only had one match, you'd say, is it the mother's side or the father's side? Exactly. That was related. This way you could know it's the mother's or the father's side. You go back in time, and someone mm -hmm. born around 1800 was it a, was a common ancestor? That's right. These two trees converged at this common ancestral couple. So it told me exactly which branch of this top matches family tree I needed to focus on. Then what do you do? So then I do reverse genealogy. I have to find all of the descendants of this ancestral couple. I'm looking for someone who's in the right place at the right time, the right gender, the right age, and is gone because this person obviously has been gone since at least 1985. There should be no record of him. Mm -hmm. So I traced it to this family with 10 children, and I could find all nine of those children online, on social media, with lives, and one missing person. Mm -hmm. And his name was Roger Kelso. And I became convinced that he was very likely so again, our we, John Doe. You take this couple, you have a great grandfather that's matching, then you know that you have the grandmother of the unidentified man in that trash right. can who had a daughter who then had Roger Kelso, the one of the yes. 10 children. This is Roger, but what was so confusing is that the medical examiner had determined that the person had been in that trash can for only about five months in 1985. Mm. But Roger had been missing since around 1962 or 1963. Huh. So the family didn't realize that this unknown doe that had been discovered in 1985 was actually their brother who'd been gone since the early 60s. Is it that often that you'll be 20 years off and estimating when someone died? Not in my experience. So that really threw this investigation for a loop. So again, because you were able to do this genetic matching, we now know Roger Kelso was the unfortunate man in that drum. That's what he actually looks like, pretty close resemblance to the Parabon imaging. And when we come back, for years, the family of Roger Kelso believed he was missing. Now they're faced with the painful news that his body has been identified. We're going to hear from his sisters and how they reacted to this tragic news. Don't go away. An Oz exclusive. George and Cindy Anthony on the rumors. How do you feel about Casey having more children? And a potential reunion. What would it take for her to come back? That's coming up next week. The Preppy Murder. The side you haven't heard of the story you thought you knew. That's coming up on Tuesday. Medical mysteries. She thought she had a brain tumor, but what it turned out to be... They found an egg. ...was a deadly worm. Put it under a microscope and out came a tapeworm. Came out of the egg. That's coming up tomorrow. We are back with investigative genealogist C.C. Moore and detective Regina Collier, who stopped at nothing to identify the body of Roger Kelso, buried decades ago in a metal trash can. Joining us now via Zoom is Mary Ellen and Gail, two of Roger Kelso's sisters. So, Gail, you spent your family, you know, actually your whole family, the decades searching for Roger. How did you all cope with the news that he had been murdered? We were just shocked. I was just, I was just so amazed and surprised that that they were able to find him. We were. It was sad that he was found murdered, but just the fact that he was found brought a lot of relief to the family. It was, it was a, actually sort of a good feeling to know that he was located because, for so many years, we didn't know. We, didn't know where he was. We looked for him, we searched internet, and just couldn't find him. Mary Ellen, tell us what was going on in Roger's life at the time that you lost track of him. He was looking forward to a job. Even as early as January 1962, he was looking for a job. And he had heard about a job, but he didn't give us details. And we thought it was a continuation of a spiritual quest he was on. And, um, when he left, he was very positive and very hopeful. And uh, there was nothing to fear. I remember looking at him as he left the door. He was, um, 
he had a large bill, and I didn't worry about him physically. Yo, what's the last memory you have of Roger? He was very kind. He was very good with children. And he used to read to me. And I remember uh, he was the big brother everybody would want a little girl to have. We, we all looked up to him. And he, he, I just remember he took the time out of his life to spend time with his sisters and with me. He was, I enjoyed the books and I enjoyed the reading. And I just remembered that. And Mary Ellen, what, what was the first time the family realized that he was missing, that something was wrong? Just because he didn't, it took so long to hear back from him after he left. And he missed important events. He missed the birth of his little brother. He would have loved having a little brother. He missed my wedding. So these are significant events, even Christmas, Easter, little by little. But we tried to find him just for years. But early on, that's when we thought, this is taking too long. And what has this, this break meant for your family, finally understanding what really happened to your brother? Oh, it's been just wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, just wonderful knowing what happened, not knowing how he died, but that's important. But just uh, knowing where his body was, and it's meant a great deal. We finally have peace. We have closure for this. The whole DNA testing to me is amazing. I think everybody should do that just for the sake of solving crimes. I think it's awesome. Well, that's a big point. I'm going to harp on in a second because up next, what you can do to help solve cases like the Roger Kelso murder mystery. That is next. Are you a true crime junkie? A secret sleuth? If so, we need you to help solve the crime. Head to DrOz.com slash Crime Hunters to join in on our investigation. We'll be posting exclusive evidence, clues, and special police bulletins. Look closely because you have the power to crack the case. Become a Dr. Oz Crime Hunter today. We are back investigating the recent identification of Roger Kelso, a man who was murdered and buried in a metal trash can decades ago. Rejoining us are investigative genealogist C.C. Moore and Detective Regina Collier. Dr. Collier, what kept this case front and center for you guys? Well, with cold cases, all of our victims have voices. They're, everyone is a loved one of someone, and it never sat right with us that this unknown individual didn't have anybody. So he basically became part of the Anne Arundel County Police Department's family. Mm. In fact, he was there with us for all these years. Our evidence technicians even put up a Christmas stocking for him at that time. Oh my That's, goodness. So he just became part of us. And we wanted to know who does he have out there. So when we finally did make the notification, meeting Gail and Mary Ellen, you could see that he was surrounded by people that loved him and people that never stopped looking for them themselves. What tips are you looking for now that could help identify what happened to him, who killed him? Basically anything and everything. Um, in order for us to do a proper homicide investigation, we have to know our victim. So anyone that knew Roger, feel free to call me, give me any information that you may know if you were friends with him, if you knew who he hung out with. Just I have to do my victimology of Roger before I can properly do a homicide investigation to find out what happened to him. Cece, how can folks at home, everyday people, catch killers, help find these wanted suspects? Well, sometimes an entire case can change because a new person uploaded, like this case. We were stumped for almost a year. And it really can make a difference with every single person who's willing to contribute their DNA to GEDmatch and allow us to use that to compare to both suspects and victims like Roger. So let me break it down. If everybody uploaded their profile to so the free site GEDmatch.com, it's free, we could all become part of the crime-fighting community. I did it, right? Why wouldn't you want to contribute? And I'm going to put instructions on my Crime Hunters page so you can all take action now. And remember, it's very important. If you've already uploaded your profile to GEDmatch, and I'm proud if you did, make sure you go back in just once and opt in. you got to just check the box so law enforcement can access your file so we can solve some of these unsettling cases. We'll be right back. 
Medical mysteries. How can a sore throat leave you in a coma? It just got worse and worse and worse until eventually I had to call 911. And she thought she had a brain tumor, but what it turned out to be... They found the egg. ...was a deadly worm. Put it under a microscope and out came a tapeworm. Came out of the egg. Plus, Dr. Oz gets real on health court. The decisions you're making are going to cost you your life. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. An Oz exclusive. George and Cindy Anthony on the rumors. How do you feel about Casey having more children? And a potential reunion. What would it take for her to come back? That's coming up next week. On the next true crime, in the early morning hours, after a night out with friends, this bright young college student, Jody McCornu, was brutally shot and killed. For over two decades, her twin sister Jenny has stopped at nothing to find justice for Jody, even placing large billboards all over the city of Baltimore. Take a look. March 1st, 1996, Jody Lacornu, a 23-year-old college student at Townsend University in Maryland, enjoyed a few drinks with friends at her favorite tavern in Baltimore. She chatted with the bartender, and at closing, agreed to drive one of the tavern employees home. She stopped by an ATM and then bought a six-pack of beer. Around 3.40 a.m., Jody parked her Honda Civic at an empty shopping center parking lot. She made two calls before a white BMW pulled up near her car. She interacted with a stocky African-American man through her open driver's side window. Before he left, he pulled out a gun and shot her in the back. On the next True Crime, we're asking who killed Jody Lacornu and why? Jody's twin sister, Jenny, will be here, and she needs your help to find her sister's killer. I'll see you next time.